makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. The Atlanta Fed President, uh, Rafael Bostic, pushes back on rate cuts amid mixed U.S. data. Markets await U.S. producer prices due later today. Another blow for the U.K. Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, as the ruling Conservative Party suffers two heavy by-election losses. There's some positive news on the economic front as retail sales rise the most since 2021. Plus, the wars in Gaza and Ukraine and the fallout from Donald Trump's NATO remarks are set to dominate the agenda as world leaders meet in Germany. Now, we'll be speaking to the Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration at the Munich Security Conference. We'll also have an exclusive conversation with the Greek Prime Minister's Chief Economic Advisor. Both of those are coming up shortly. But first, as, as always, looking at the European markets map. So this is a picture across the board. Now, stocks broadly higher. A lot of news to digest on what various Fed officials have talked about. Again, the risk on mood seems to be prevailing after a little bit of a wonky week overall for some of these markets. Um, it does follow, of course, another record on Wall Street and also some encouraging Chinese consumption data. I would argue that the data point of the day we don't often talk about is PPI over in the U.S. And again, that will give us an indication or investors want to know uh, what that means for the economy and therefore the probability of Fed cuts. Now, to talk about these markets, we're now joined by Sonia Martin, head of FX and monetary policy at DZ Bank, who joins us now. Sonia, thank you so much um, for joining us. We're also joined, of course, by Justina Lee. Always great to see, especially on a Friday, actually, to, to see exactly what, what's going on with the markets. And then we'll get to Sonia in a second. Justina, when you look at um, some of the things that the market is latching onto, again, it's inflation, it's Fed speak. Is there, you know, is it now almost a done deal because we heard from ECB really trying to push the message that we could even see a March cut, or certainly from some officials, that we get ECB cutting before the Fed? Yeah, that would certainly be a big deal. And it's kind of evident if you look at the currency trends lately, right? Because I think going into 2024, everyone thought, you know, this is the end of the reign of the U.S. dollar. But lately, we have seen the U.S. dollar kind of pick up a little bit versus other currencies. And I think one reason is sort of this shift in their narrative. I mean, a lot of people are glomming on to, you know, for instance, like what Fed official Boston kind of said overnight and kind of what the U.S. data on CPI is showing. And they're kind of thinking, is the order going to be different? from what we previously expected. Yeah, and Justina, let's listen to what Rafael Bostic had to say. We will likely soon contemplate the appropriate time for monetary policy to become less restrictive. Right now, a strong labor market and macroeconomy offer the chance to execute these policy decisions without oppressive urgency. Put simply, we have made substantial and gratifying progress in slowing the pace of inflation. All things considered, the U.S. economy is in a good spot, even an enviable spot compared to other major economies. Uh, Sonia, what, thank you for joining us. Sonia Martin there from DZ Bank. Nice pink as well for Friday. Sonia, <laughs> what do you make of now, you know, market expectations of what the, you know, how many cuts we'll get from the Fed? Well, we've obviously seen a lot of volatility in those expectations. And the markets really, really ran ahead of themselves, you know, late last year with these really aggressive rate cut expectations. They have been scaled down. And I think that's correct. I mean, we've long held the view that the Fed will not be able to cut as much as the market is expecting. We have 75 basis points on the agenda for this year. So that's still less than the market is, is expecting right now. And as Bostic said, the economy is still very strong. The labor market is strong. And inflation, while it has come off a long way, is still too high. So the Fed needs to be careful. It can't cut too early. It needs to cut because real, the real policy rate has risen because of the decline in inflation. But it is going to be in a rush. So we're looking at the summer, probably June for a first rate cut. So, Sonia, what does that mean in terms of, again, are we are also seeing a lot of productivity gains when it comes to the U.S. economy. Is this economy going to be much, much stronger than we're expecting it to be? I think it already is a lot stronger than everyone was expecting it to be. I mean, we've been 
facing the slowdown, the, even at times a recession for a long time now, and it's clearly not happening. So I think we've already reached this point where I think those expectations for a significant slowdown have been priced out of the market. Some people are talking about no landing, but at the very least, we're looking at only a very moderate decline in growth. So the U.S. has defeated all expectations. It's sustained you know, high interest rates without too much damage. And so, you know, we're probably already at this point where the market has priced that in. I mean, I don't really see how much more upside surprises we can actually get here. What does that mean, Justina, on how, again, you look at the markets and actually what it means for treasuries? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because today we had a headline saying that a fund manager, Jupiter, is actually going to buy treasuries because they still see a hard landing. And I think today I also saw a Jeffrey strategist was like, this is actually an attractive point to start holding treasuries. And I think maybe for some investors, if you have a long enough, long enough perspective, I mean, with rate cuts still on the table, this is a good time to start buying. But of course, if you kind of on the shorter end, we've got to weigh that against much broader inflation than investors previously previously expected. Yeah, and to Justina's very good point, Sonia, are there parts of the market that actually seem unloved at the moment, even commercial real estate, that will be, you know, very loved if interest rates go down as much as expected? So this is a good buying opportunity. Well, I certainly think we're very much still in a sort of very friendly market environment, and that's unlikely to change. I mean, you're, you know, you're looking at rate cuts, maybe not as much as people thought, but we're still looking at rate cuts. That's going got to be good for the equity market. We're looking at fairly ro very robust growth in the U.S. We're looking at a mild recovery in Germany and Europe in, as a whole. So I think it's still a very friendly overall market environment. You know, but there are, of course, certain risk factors in the equation. We're all trying to figure out, you know, geopolitics, U.S. elections, all of those things. So I think we're still looking at a year with considerable volatility just because there are so many question marks in the mix right now. And investors are going to remain, I think, very event and data driven in that environment. Uh, Sonia, what does that mean for your call on U.S. dollar? And what does that mean actually for some of your fair pairing? I know you've been looking at, for example, dollar yen. Mm. Looking at the dollar, I mean, you know, euro dollar specifically, um, I actually, we now have a fairly flat forecast around 108, which always looks a bit boring, I know. But the fact of the matter is we're going to get a pretty wild mix of influence factors. You know, the recovery in the eurozone, you know, there's still very strong U.S. economy with, with little surprise potential to the upside, I think. So we're probably going to see quite a volatile trading range. But I see in euro dollar certainly no clear trends. When you're looking at dollar yen, it's more interesting because because we still have the BOJ in the mix with the hope that they will at some point, you know, move away from its ultra expansionary stance. And that should definitely boost the yen. So the dollar yen downside is still very attractive. Uh, Justina, again, uh, it feels like the PPI, which is, I don't know if we largely ignore it, mm. but it's not one of, you know, the, the data points that we look at the most today will be quite significant, Justina. Right, exactly. And based on what economists are expecting, they do see a bit of a pickup on a month on month basis, but kind of the year on year trend still showing kind of inflation gradually cooling. And I think what was really notable and which is why people are paying so much attention to this PPI number is that from what we saw earlier this week, I mean, US CPI, it's not just about one category or two categories. I mean, it really showed a pickup, especially in terms of like, you know, rent in terms of like housing costs. And I think so people are definitely kind of looking for signs that the U.S. economy might even be reaccelerating, despite sort of the lagged effects of monetary policy supposedly coming through. And Sonia, I know I have quite a lot of viewers that are actually sending me charts on productivity in the U.S., which is phenomenal after, mm. you know, two, three years of yeah. stagnation. It's really picking up. I mean, could that be the, the next boost to really drive the U.S. economy? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the surprise in productivity, the, the increase in productivity has come, I think, as a bit of a surprise. And there's, of course, you know, a lot of uh, discussions around where that's coming from. You know, one factor probably has been the tightness of the labor market, which has, you know, driven probably efficiency in processes. That's probably given a boost to productivity. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's one more factor which is driving a very strong U.S. economy and is preventing, you know, a slowdown. Although, obviously, there are pockets of, well, I'm not going to say weakness, but there are certainly pockets of concern. But overall, it's just really, really strong. Consumption remains strong. Uh, there is really no sign of a of a serious let up. And I, I can understand investors that are still concerned. I mean, there's a mm. fear, I think, that, you know, people have held on to a slowdown story for a very long time and are kind of scared to throw it overboard at the last, you know, at the, at the worst possible moment. But yeah, I mean, the U.S. is looking very solid. No question about it.
Sonia, thank you so much. Sonia Martin there, Head of FX and Monetary Policy at DZ Bank and our very own Justina Lee. Now coming up, the UK Labour Party has taken two seats from Rishi Sunak's Conservatives. How will the Prime Minister regain momentum after this double election blow? Will he? We'll discuss that next. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now here in the UK, Keir Starmer's opposition Labour Party has overturned significant Conservative majorities to win two parliamentary by-elections. Now Labour continues to lead in the national polls and this morning's results further than to Rishi Sunak's hopes of regaining momentum after uh, this year's general election. Now to discuss all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Adam Blenford. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, this was, you know, pretty extraordinary, extraordinary result. Does this translate into the general election? Um, it's, always, it's always difficult to translate a local result where there's been specific opportunity for uh, thumbing your nose at the government to a general election. But it's very true that Labour has won a series of these by-elections now um, over the course of the recent Parliament. And, and these were really striking results. The, you know, the second biggest swing to Labour in the post-war general uh, by-elections. Yeah. 28.5% um, in Wellingborough, and very large Tory majorities were overturned and wiped out just in the space of one night. Um, so uh, marry that with opinion polls no. nationally, which have um, wobbled a little recently, but, no. but generally have been very much in favour of Labour for a long time now. Um, and it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, an election has to be held very soon. Um, and it will be very difficult for uh, the Conservatives to overturn this kind of momentum. So all parties will now be back home kind of strategizing on what the spy election means for, you know, the elections. Will they be in the spring or uh, in the autumn? That's another question. What about Reform UK? So this is basically a far right party in the UK. They've come out of the, what used to be the Brexit party. Yeah. They were formerly led by Nigel Farage. And, and, and they, they had a significant impact on the last election when right. Boris Johnson won a big right. majority because they decided not to run in quite right. a lot of seats. What they did last night was they took a lot of the Conservative support. Labour increased its gain by, by some, something around 10% in both of these seats. Right. Reform did the same, and the Conservatives lost around 20 or thereabouts. Right. So there'll be a significant factor if they choose to run on a platform of anti-immigration, anti-European, and, um, and general uh, dissatisfaction with the way that Sunak has run the Conservative government. So they're basically splitting up the, the Tory party, right? They're uh, kind of to the right wing of the Tory party. They, that's what, certainly what they say. There may very well be some disaffected Labour voters who went to Brexit party voters in the yeah. past, but in general, reforms seem to think they have a lock on kind of the right wing of the right. Conservative electorate. Adam, thank you so much. Adam Blenford there with the very latest on UK politics. Uh, coming up, the AI race is heating up between big tech with new developments from Apple and OpenAI. We discuss all of this with Michael Fertig, founder of Silicon Valley VC firm Heroic Ventures. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Apple is nearing the completion of a new AI software tool for app developers. Sources say it will predict and complete blocks of code. Now, the move sees the firm stepping up its competition with Microsoft. Meanwhile, OpenAI, which has a multi-billion dollar partnership with Microsoft, has also teased a new system that can create realistic looking videos based on text prompts from users. Now, the company's chief executive, Sam Altman, says the AI tool called Sora and quickly create videos up to a minute long, making it the latest company to embrace generative video technology. Now, let's discuss all of this, uh, some of the AI headlines with Michael Furtick, founder of Silicon Valley VC firm Heroic Ventures, credited with pioneering the field of online reputation management. There's so much going on, Michael. So I'm so much. happy to, to have you here. When you look at AI and when you look at, you know, NVIDIA really going from strength to strength, we mm. know that the city of London is like, why did we not get that arm, um, you know, listing? Right. Because also valuations were quite incredible. Right. Is the sky the limit? I think the sky's the limit. Look, I don't comment on public stocks. I'm not a professional public stock investor. I do hold NVIDIA in all of these stocks, like most of your viewers probably. I do think the sky's the limit. This is the third time in my career, I'm now 45, where I think I've seen something that is going to have a before and after epo epochal change. So internet, CRISPR, and now AI. I think that 
the AI movement will have at least as big an economic GDP impact as the internet has, maybe yeah. greater. Yeah. And so does that translate into an ever-growing stock price? That I can't say. Yeah. But I'm bullish on it. I'm also bullish on private companies. I've invested in private competitors, emerging competitors to the NVIDIAs of the world, because these machines are hungry. And the LLMs and the models are hungry. They have enormous computing power. So I do yeah. think that the, yeah. the demand for the chips will be increasing. But, Michael, there's something you know, quite strange, but also that people are quite excited about in the US economy, which is productivity is suddenly going up. Is this yeah. because of the tools that we're using? And is, I don't know where you would qualify as being. Is it just pre-AI dominance? Like, you know, how are chief executives using AI? At well, a revolution like this usually takes a little bit longer and then goes faster. What, then two months? <laughs> okay, fair, it could be. You know, you know, I tell you, I've been doing tech since I'm 19. I'm now 45. Every two weeks I wake up and say, oh my goodness, something has changed. I will say that I, I don't know if the productivity is attributable on a GDP scale to AI yet. I do think in the software businesses, your kind of early stage junior developers are basically now being replaced by AI. The bottom 20%, the most junior 20%. Whether this has yet put its tendrils into the global economy or the software economy globally yet, Eh, I think it's premature to say, but it is coming. It's coming in video. Yeah. It's coming in healthcare. It's coming in software. It's coming in trading. Oh my goodness! Do you think that lift roller coaster was done by humans a few days ago when the stock but price so roller coaster? So what are you focusing on? Computers. Productivity or job losses? I'm focusing on growth. I always focus on growth. So, productivity is going to be uh, always the driver of all revenue. Uh, as an investor, I would like to look for companies that can give the CFO, the CEO, the CMO more yeah. revenue. There are about 20% of successful companies that look to save the company money. I think those are less exciting to me. Yeah. I'm always looking for companies that can make the company or company wealthier, that create more shareholder value through gains. Larger yeah. revenue leads to larger margins, but not sort of uh, margin compression through, through savings. Although I will say, you know, you are seeing now the biggest companies in the world, like Apple, as you say, assist their economies mm -hmm in bringing more app developers, more of their ecosystem onto their platform using AI. And whether that, whether that entails software development, software code completion, or something else like just, yeah. hey, we'll make your onboarding easier, yeah. All that's going to go to gains to companies like Apple. But so Michael, so if you look at, for example, Apple, and I know you don't comment on individual stocks, especially right. the ones that are listed, yeah. but if you look at the valuation now, does it double from here or otherwise lose it? Like a lot of these big AI companies uh -huh. is, again, do they have to get much bigger and much stronger in terms of growth or otherwise lose everything? Here's how I can answer that question. A lot of the AI game right now is turning into a little bit like the search game of 10 or 20 years ago. The search game turns out to be a hardware game. You need a lot of memory, yeah. a lot of data in state so as to be able to deliver search results in femtoseconds, right? And so in the same sense, if you have an enormous balance sheet and can afford these very expensive computers yeah. and thousands and thousands of them, you have a structural advantage. It's very hard for startups, even well-capitalized startups, to compete with that because you need all this hardware for that's money for capex right. and therefore i think a lot of the gains will go to the big companies that are already right. large what's that capex doing so again our bloomberg sources say for example that apple is looking at you know to rival microsoft to give the better tools to do coding for you like uh -huh. what's the next frontier well uh, you asked the you asked the, the key questions what is the capex doing it's buying enormous server farms enormous and by the way these nvidia chips that's not are... private equity are they buying <laughs> <laughs> well, well, by the way, they, you know what just happened is Salesforce, I believe if I'm not mistaken, just announced an investment in a company that is effectively reselling access right. to these server farms for NVIDIA chips because they're so scarce, they're so expensive, and you need so many of them to power these enormous models that the balance sheet heavy companies, these rich enormously cash rich companies have an advantage to buy them deploy yeah. them and create speed that no startup can replicate but michael so is this infrastructure and again it's clear like we need a new ecosystem right if ai is really going to take off so do you play it through the ai players or is it actually just infrastructure and maybe renewables or greening the, the technology? as usual you're two steps ahead of the market francine you're exactly right so the big structural companies will have the hardware but then the ecosystem of applications of frameworks uh -huh. of layers on top top of those LLMs, those models, those infrastructures, that's where the gains will come for the startup eco ecosystem, for companies that are not already enormous software giants and hardware giants. That's where 
I think much of the trillions of dollars of wealth creation will actually come. You're exactly right. Um, Michael, I know the UK, you know, in an election year, is basically trying to pitch itself for the current administration as, you know, the frontier of AI, uh -huh, the frontier uh -huh. of technology. They want to be the next NASDAQ. Uh -huh. I mean, can they do it, or is it going to be no. France and no, others that, that will no, be quicker? No, 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 the UK will not be the next NASDAQ of AI. But I do think Rishi Sunak is trying to uh, uh, pitch the UK as a place where AI can flourish. And so far, I think there's a good case that AI can flourish in the UK. The EU is already passing legislation which could actually strangle innovation right. in the AI If you do field. it too fast. And in fact, I think that legislation will become law, I predict, this summer. So the UK is actually playing a little bit more of a libertarian game. So there is reason for to believe that, that, that these progressive corporates in the UK, these very powerful multinationals headquartered here, with a libertarian regulatory outlook, could allow AI to flourish in the UK. But is it going to become the NASDAQ of, of AI? No. I'll just end that discussion here. No, it will Why? not become. Why? Because of capital attraction? Because, or it's, it's, a because very small it's a very small country relative to the countries like the United yeah. States and China that have all the capital to make that capital investment necessary. We need to talk China. We, you need to come back so we talk I'm China. I'm ready to talk China. But there I'm you ready go. To come back. Anytime for you, anything for you, Francie. Michael, thanks so much. As always, Michael Furtick there of Heroic Ventures. Now, coming up, we're live at the Munich Security Conference, the Ukraine Deputy uh, Prime Minister for European Integration. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Well, the Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic pushes back on rate cuts amid mixed U.S. data. Markets await U.S. producer prices due later today. Another blow for the U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak as a ruling Conservative Party suffers two heavy by-election losses. But there's some positive news on the economic front as retail sales rise the most since 2021. Plus, the wars in Gaza and Ukraine and the fallout from Donald Trump's NATO remarks are set to dominate the agenda as world leaders meet in Germany. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is set to meet the German chancellor, Olaf Scholz, later this morning in Berlin. He then heads to France, where Zelensky is expected to sign a bilateral security deal with the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Now, it comes as Ukraine struggles with ammunition shortages and U.S. military aid is delayed on Capitol Hill. All of this high on the agenda this week's weekend's Munich Security Conference, which President Zelensky is expected to attend over the weekend. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Ross Matheson, Bloomberg's EMEA news director. There is a lot going on, Ross. When you look at world leaders actually convening in Munich, what will be front of mind? Well, obviously, Ukraine is going to be front of mind for all the reasons you were just saying. You know, Ukraine struggling on the ground to push back Russia, shortages of weapons, shortages of financial aid, all of that's being held up in various places, including the U.S., and not really getting a lot of traction, you know, in, in the calls for support. And that's why it's going to be interesting to see the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, if he's there, uh, how his conversations go. Of course, some of his most recent appearances, including at UNGA, weren't particularly successful. So is he able to rally there and, and get more support that he says is needed. But in a way, Munich will be about some of the things that are really out of control of the leaders right now. And first and foremost, that's going to be what kind of government are we going to have in the US after the election in November? But, so if there is a funding gap, you know, that the US doesn't put as much money as they said they would, can, the US, can Europe actually step up to help Ukraine? Well, Europe is stepping up, arguably. They are increasing the aid uh, to Ukraine. They're increasing their own defence spending also to kind of ward off those criticisms by Donald Trump about how much they're contributing towards NATO and collective defence in Europe. But the question is, how quickly can that aid get there and how much is needed versus what Europe can supply? And certainly we know even now, Europe's not managed to meet its pledges on ammunition. It's promised certain amounts of ammo to get to Ukraine. It's not met those promises, existing promises, let alone future promises. So even if they pledge further aid, there's going to be a gap in that arriving. Uh, how will the Munich Security Conference actually aggress Israel and, and Gaza? 
Well, that's the other big question in the room, obviously, for, for leaders and other officials who are meeting there. You, you're seeing this pressure on Israel from Europe, from the US, increasingly yet another phone conversation between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu, where Joe Biden is saying, please don't do a ground offensive into Rafah in that area near the Egyptian border against the Palestinians there, unless you've got a proper plan for the security of civilians who are there. And yet Israel seems determined either way to go ahead. So what are we going to see in terms of meetings in Munich to kind of push that message again collectively, that warning to Israel? But will it have any effect? So far, it just seems that Netanyahu is determined either way. But, Raz, what would have an effect? I mean, could the U.S. actually turn around and say, look, we're stopping funding and support? If, if, if you don't take care of civilian casualties? Well, that would be a very big move by the US because they are a strategic military and trade ally with the US, with Israel rather. But also for Joe Biden, there's got to be the calculations again of an election year. Do you want to be really doing that to Israel uh, when he's also got to think about, you know, the voting base at home in the US, including uh, Jewish voters? Yeah. Uh, Ros, very quickly on Ukraine, and we have actually the Ukraine Deputy Prime Minister, I think, who's joining us very shortly. But is there a danger that as the world focuses so much on, you know, the Middle East and, and that part of the world that Ukraine has forgotten. Well, that's certainly even something that Zelensky himself has noticed and talked about um, in recent months is that, you know, obviously, you know, Ukraine expresses solidarity with what's been happening in the Middle East and with Israel after that Hamas attack. Uh, but even he said it's like it's awkward because does it take away the focus and attention from Ukraine? That's got to be an absolute reality. Ros, thank you so much. Let's also bring in Ola Stefanishina, uh, Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration. She joins us now from the Munich Security Conference. Uh, Deputy PM, thank, thank you so much, much uh, for joining us. The president, your president, President Zelensky, is actually signing a bilateral security agreement today with France and Germany. Is that now a more pressing path forward rather than EU or even NATO membership? Uh, well, it's an inevitable ele uh, element of shielding uh, submilitary and financial support to Ukraine and advancing uh, military and industrial cooperation and production, making sure, uh, making sure that Ukraine is capable to defend itself and Europe is capable to defend itself for as long as it takes in practice. So it's vital. At the same time, uh, these are the, the arrangements which form the bilateral basis for security and defense cooperation shape up the legal commitment on uh, support to Ukraine's territorial integrity and serenity, but also are operational until Ukraine becomes a member of NATO. So, uh, so we are having a discussion here, and President Zelensky have already arrived to, uh, to Berlin, and uh, hopefully there are more good news to follow. So the EU agreed to open you know, membership talks back in December. I know there's also a financial aid package that was passed earlier this month. What do you see as your two, three priorities actually g going forward? Uh, well, it was a very important decision to us. Uh, and uh, basically, European process and Ukraine's membership to EU is the major guideline and the mapping of the democratic reforms. It's a very important transformation that we are putting to uh, our focus, uh, reforms related to the rule of law, democratic freedoms, democratic institutions. It's the core of our existence. Uh, while we're fighting the war, it's very, very important that we make and keep the country being fully functional, operational and, um, and democratic. So that's the core of our accession process to EU and that's how we work. In fact, Ukrainian delegation will head over to Brussels already this week for the first round of negotiations on the rule of law. Uh, there's a recent German research group that actually put out a report only today saying that the EU would probably need to double military aid if the U.S. gap or if the U.S. assistance uh, for Ukraine remains stalled. Have you had any assurance or do you think that the EU would be able to, to provide that assistance and is there a political will and the money? Well, decades uh, and, uh, and the years of uh, fatigue and uh, basically um, uh, misbelief that the full-scale war could take place at the heart of the Europe has led to the situation where it would take a bit more time to enhance or reinvent the defense policy at the European continent, to understand that 
protecting the values, you have to have the weapons, the military, the army and the war in Ukraine has really uh, make it very brightly seen. So I am sure and confident that Germany, European Union, together with other allies and partners across Europe will make sure that Europe is capable to defend itself. And uh, the gap analysis has been done. The decisions will be taken like, like uh, EU defense strategy, EU common defense industrial policy. But for the major thing for Ukraine is to withstand throughout this period and make sure that we curve our victory and make sure that Europe will be able to preserve it. How concerned are you about the delays in U.S. support? And is that likely to get better or worse under a potential Trump presidency? Uh, well, uh, we, have a, uh, we have this slight movement in terms of the decision, and now in Congress it has went to, to, to a, a break until the beginning of March. We, we have still a slight hope, but uh, of course we cannot ignore the fact that it's already for uh, almost uh, three or four months Ukraine does not have any decision on, uh, on support, and it already forms a gap in our ability to, uh, to cover the, the liquidity in the budget and also the forecast and plan for the military support. So the problems are taking place and occurring already right now. Um, uh, we have the hope. We, uh, we are working on the different B and C plans. We do the contingency planning on our side. But at the same time, we see a lot of politics and political rhetorics related to uh, elections in, in this discourse. So we hope that uh, our hope is based on the understanding that politics is politics, but the uh, sovereign interests yeah. of the United States uh, to uh, preserve uh, the democratic democracy around the globe will prevail on both sides. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Olga Stefanishina, there, Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration. Now still with us, at Bloomberg's Ross Matheson. And Ross, I know President Zelensky has also said that actually this year will be very decisive. I mean, again, and we, we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister for EU Integration about maybe some of the timelines that they're working at. Um, but also on the ground, it's not necessarily going the way they want it to go. Well, certainly that's right. You could see there from the comments, obviously, a strong awareness of the timeline and as it gets further into the U.S. election cycle. But also we've got European Union uh, elections in June, and that's going to come into some of the rhetoric that you might see in Europe, because it's not just in the U.S. that you're asking some of those conversations about where is this war going? We are entering the third year very soon. Uh, it's very bogged down on the ground. Uh, Russia is starting perhaps to make some further advances again uh, because Ukraine is quite clearly struggling uh, for ammunition and weapons. And so is the war starting to go uh, on the ground at least? I mean, Ukraine's had success sinking Russian ships, which has to be noted. But, you know, in territory, it looks like Russia might be not far off some fairly strategic moves uh, there, and that would really set back things for Ukraine. Uh, Ross, we also heard from, you know, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, saying that, I mean, he gave two big interviews, and I don't know whether he's feeling emboldened or he, he actually waited on the U.S. election, but it's a, it's a little bit nuanced. It's unclear, actually, what his, what, who he wants to win the presidential election, well, or whether we care. Well, that's right. It was interesting to see those comments. I mean, obviously, he's coming into his own election very soon where there doesn't seem to be any element of doubt that Vladimir Putin's going to win that election and be ready for another term. And so is he feeling fairly confident about that? He's managed to really squash any opposition, political or otherwise, at home to himself. And so he can play the longer game, potentially, at this point. He can look through some of the election cycles elsewhere in the US because he's, he's locked in for another term. And he made some comments about Joe Biden... Um, where he called him reliable, predictable, old style. And on the surface of it, that sounds like he says, well, Biden is someone I can deal with and I would prefer as president. But is that because he thinks that Joe Biden is an equal partner or someone using those words again, predictable, understandable, old style politician, someone he thinks that he can actually get his way with? Um, so perhaps it wasn't really an overt compliment of Joe Biden. So interesting, Ross. Thank you so much, as always. Ross Matheson our EMEA News Director. Coming up, Greece has approved landmark legalization, of course, of same-sex marriage. Well, we'll discuss that and the latest on the nation's economy with the Greek Prime Minister's Chief Economic Advisor. That exclusive conversation is up next, and this is Bloomberg.
Now, Greece became the first major Orthodox Christian country to legalize same-sex civil marriage yesterday. The landmark legislation was approved despite opposition from the socially conservative church. Now, to discuss this, I'm very pleased to welcome Alex Patelis, the chief economic advisor to the Greek prime minister who joins us now from Athens for this exclusive conversation. Alex, as always, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time. This was a landmark decision. What do you think it tells us about Greece today? Thank you so much. Good morning, Francine. Um, and uh, if you recall, it was at this show uh, last summer that the Prime Minister first broached this subject. And yesterday, Greece became the 16th country um, in the European Union, the 21st country uh, in Europe, and the 36th, 37th I'm sorry, country in the world to legislate uh, marriage equality. I should uh, mention that uh, Greece was the 10th country to join the European Economic Community back in uh, 1991, mm -hmm. also under New Democracy and Kostadinos Um And today, uh, the, the story you put together, your team at Bloomberg uh, this morning, has a very uh, interesting map that shows uh, precisely what you mentioned before, that, that Greece um, is um, the first country in this part of the world uh, to legislate mm -hmm. marriage equality, and uh, we are very proud for that. Alex, I have uh, many questions on, of course, Piraeus Bank on Athens Airport. But when you speak to investors, when you speak to people that want to put capital in Greece, what do they ask you now? So uh, there's a huge um, optimism on Greece following the double election last summer, the uh, upgrade to investment grade, um, and of course, uh, the global environment uh, looks better. There was an oversubscription of the National Bank of Greece. Um, uh, sale a few months ago, over, massive oversubscription of the uh, airport IPO. And ahead of us, we have the Piraeus Bank uh, sale. We're seeing huge demand there as well. It's likely to happen uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And uh, we are optimistic that this will also be a, a successful sale. Uh, Francine, in terms of the questions uh, investors ask, they're the standard questions. Um, how can we participate in this story? What other opportunities um, are there? Uh, Greece still is a small country with a relatively small stock market, uh, but the upcoming sale of Peros Bank shares is one example of how people can uh, participate. Um, when you look at, and it's great that you mentioned Perius Banks, we know that a lot of investors are, are looking at that to, to see also you know, how much you're selling. I think the Prime Minister said that it would be a significant stake. Would it be the, the full 27% or less? That decision hasn't yet been made. It is a decision to be made by the HFSF, but uh, it's looking optimistic mm -hmm. at this point. There's also, of course, the IPO of a 30% stake in Athens Airport that was completed um, certainly last week. It was a huge success, I think the biggest in two decades. Is the Athens Stock Exchange back? Yes, and the objective now, of course, the sovereign Hellenic Republic uh, regained investment grade last year. The objective is now for the Athens Stock Exchange to rejoin developed market status. Um, hopefully, uh, an announcement would be made uh, sometime this year with completion next year. You know, there's a lot of uh, debate amongst investors. Some investors say, why don't you want to remain uh, emerging market and be a bigger fish in a small pond? Uh, but uh, our view is very simple. Greece is part of the European Union. It's part of the euro. Uh, it's a developed market. Um, it has marriage equality now. So, of course, it's going to be uh, part of developed market uh, countries, the stock market. Um, and the, uh, the so, airport IPO that you mentioned before also helps that objective. You know, you need large uh, listed companies with, uh, with uh, large free float to be able to uh, rejoin developed markets. Is it now that there's, you know, obviously some investor appetite, will that lead to more IPOs? Um, hopefully. I think that is the case. You know, there's still some sectors that are not represented uh, properly in the Greek stock market. Uh, shipping, for example, tourism, technology. There are specific sectors that, that I believe that the um, Athens Stock Exchange leadership uh, is looking at. But I should mention here on a different topic as well, it's not just about listed companies. Um, we still continue to look for uh, foreign direct investment. The Prime Minister is headed to India next week. Um, mm -hmm. He is a keynote speaker at the Raisina Dialogue on, uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, at, at New Delhi. And this is another example of an outward-looking Greece. Uh, 
you know, Greece is the closest country to India uh, of the EU geographically, and we want to develop ties between yeah. the two countries. Uh, there's the potential of the route between India and Europe that is being discussed, and of course opportunities in tourism and other areas. Thank you so much. Alex Patel is there, the chief economic advisor to the Greek prime minister after a very important, of course, day yesterday where Greece legalized same-sex marriage and first for an orthodox nation. Coming up, we look at fourth quarter results from British Bank NatWest, as well as what the new chief executive could mean for the company. We discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg. NatWest has reported a series of fourth quarter earning beats this morning as they confirmed Paul Thwaite as their permanent chief executive officer. Now, the bank did, however, give a cautious outlook for 2024, saying persistently high interest rates still risk weighing on revenue. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. Tom, I mean, this is interesting also because now they appointed actually a, a CEO uh, that's fully in charge. But what were the, your key takeaways from these results? Yeah, it's a few things. So it looks like a solid 2023. They did sort of be a bit cautious in 2024 as you see rates coming down. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was more almost separate things. So their provisions were, were pretty low, about half mm -hmm. of what analysts had estimated. So that's helping. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you yeah, have Paul Thwaite coming in permanently. Uh, and that's kind of injecting a little bit of solidity at the bank, which is what they need right now, because you've got the yeah. big shareholder of the government looking to sell down most of its stake. OK, motor finance exposure. I mean, yeah. you, you know, the, this is uh, something that actually some of the financial con conduct authority are looking at. Should we really worry about that at NatWest? Well, I think shareholders are very focused on it. So it's fascinating to see basically NatWest shares shot up after effective executives said, we don't really have exposure to this, because that's the thing right now. Most people thought NatWest was fairly kind of protected from this, but no one knew for sure, I suppose. So hearing that confirmation is actually what's, I think, driving the shares up so strongly yeah. today. I think 4.6%. Um, how will Paul Thwaite actually run the, the bank? Well, he's very understated, so, you know, it'd be interesting. He, uh, you know, I don't think he'll be out there much in the public eye, uh, as much as, say, maybe in Alison Rose. And, and, you know, maybe that's what they were looking for, kind of a steady pair of hands. He comes out of the commercial business side, knows the bank really well, and I think his whole focus will be just delivering sort of stable, reliable results. Tom, this is such a great story. So Deutsche Bank is tightening its work-from-home rules, joining a growing number of investment banks requiring staff to be in the office more frequently. You now, according to a memo seen by Bloomberg, Managing directors will have to come in four days a week, while other staff will need uh, to be in at least three days a week. But actually, the, I, I guess the most important part is that these new rules mean that you can't do Friday and Monday remote. Yeah, it's a really fascinating memory from Deutsche Bank. So they're kind of aligning themselves, I suppose, with a lot of the Wall Street firms we already know about, the Goldmans, you know, the JP Morgans pushing people in. But yeah, it was that detail, the fact that, let's say you work from home right. Friday, they're not going to let you work from home Monday, and that's kind of cribbing away that sort of four-day uh, from home Section. So it's really interesting, and I think it's interesting it's Deutsche Bank as well, because most German lenders have been quite sort of generous on the work-from-home yeah. approach. Uh, and this is, again, showing that, at least in Wall Street, at least in high finance, really the end of uh, work-from-home is at least we've known it for the last few years. I mean, and everybody's trying to figure out whether that means you can attract top talent. Well, I mean, this is, is there the a correlation? Debate. Well, it's, it's really interesting. I think, you know, I think in high finance there is a recognition, you know, you need to be there for your clients, you need to be in the office. So I think that's the view bosses take. But of course, you know, on the employee side, you know, if you get an offer where someone's saying, hey, we've got much more flexibility, I, I think that is becoming very, very important. And actually, you know, dare I say it, you know, up there right with pay as well. Tom, thank you so much. As always, Tom Metcalf, they're in charge of finance. Up next, the Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger and Manus Karani in New York. And this is Bloomberg. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs>